Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the best era of action movies of all time. Still working on that. Still working on <laughs> that one. We're going to keep working on that. This week is our first week where we're really going deep on our new format, which is going to be still, you know, the Go With The Heat style breakdown. Our love and fondness and you know having a little fun and maybe some people's other some other people's <laughs> expense we've had to reach out and find other don johnson products to talk about <laughs> this is our first week where we're really getting into the movies what we talked about in our secret episode last oh two three weeks ago i think is when that came out where we announced that we are coming back and that this is going to be the new format that we're going to talk about movies from the greatest era of action movies, 1975 to 1995. And just real fast, if you happen to miss that episode, it's not your fault. We actually had some problems with the feeds because, you know, they sat dormant for a while. Apparently some platforms, <coughs> Apple, wants to retire your podcast and then it stops receiving updates and then so I had to go out there and fix that. So just hey, thanks to everyone for sticking with it. If you happen to catch it in your feed, like maybe a couple of days later than what we had said <laughs> it was coming out. <laughs> but it did eventually make its way out into the into the world. So this week, what it is that we are talking about in our first movie on this new format that we're doing is Harley Davidson and the Marvel Man, which originally premiered on August 23rd, 1991. It was actually later than I thought. I feel like it, it should be a lot earlier than that by watching it, but... <laughs> <laughs> it was directed by Simon Winsor. Now, that name probably doesn't sound familiar, but I'm going to tell you the other stuff that he's directed, and it will then, the other movies will sound familiar, and you'll start to see some, maybe some crossover and some poor storytelling that <laughs> might come up here <laughs> and there in early Davis and the Marvel Man. <laughs> he also directed the science fiction movie Daryl, so D period, A period, so on and so forth. It's an acronym. Quigley Down Under. Oh. oh. Operation Dumbo Drop. Oh, God. And Crocodile oh. Dundee in Los Angeles. Oh, so not the not the original. No. Is that the second or the third? That's the third, the one that was in like 2002, 2001, what? 2002. Ooh. Ah. That's a list of movies. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's a list of movies that you could make. <laughs> <laughs> i feel like we're just listing movies that we found in a bargain bin i mean i could buy those at the dollar tree right now just saying those were all donated to a library near you <laughs> all i know is that if you want to consider yourself a serious contender in the streaming service you always get quickly down under first like yeah, it just I mean, comes with the street like is that now <laughs> we got nothing else we got out and we got quickly down under Okay, so of those movies, this movie is an improvement then. I've seen those crocodile movies. Well, those are bad. <laughs> my dad loved Quigley Down Under, so I think he would argue. <laughs> well, my him, dad would but... argue the crocodile Dundee one, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So his movies that he directed aren't necessarily, they're, they're made money, but they're not like the highest quality movie. I don't have a full list here, but he directed a ton of TV and TV miniseries. Ooh, okay. A lot of TV oh. films and TV miniseries, all kind of westerny, including oh. the original Lonesome Dove. Oh, I did like those. <laughs> I'm like, oh, but I do like Lonesome Dove. <laughs> <laughs> do you like me some Lonesome Dove? <laughs> I did like that one. <laughs> it is written by Don Michael Paul. Now he's he's got the same mixed history. He's an actor, director, writer. He's he he does all three. That's things. why he does it so well. <laughs> he is a triple threat. <laughs> As a director is where he's done most of his work, including two sniper movies, like the modern ones with Tom Berenger. Oh, okay. Well, those are okay. Uh, hmm. Tremors 5, Bloodlines. Oh. oh Kindergarten yeah. Cop 2. Oh, two. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'd argue Tremors might be better than that one. <laughs> and he also direct, uh, wrote and directed Death Race, Beyond Anarchy, the most recent one that was a Netflix exclusive. Like they, 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 they We didn't watch it. that one, Yeah, we? we did. Yes, we did watch it. Oh. That was in 2018. I, I don't think I did. Out. Oh, yeah. Okay, we did. Yeah, we watched it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so lots of movies with a colon, something, something, <laughs> colon. <laughs> I was not thinking a lot that of kind of colon. Of like number pirate. fours and number fives. Yeah. <laughs> Two and a half. He's currently working on Starship Troopers 10. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come back to that. Hold on one second, John. You're going to flip out when I when you hear this. First of all, he's got a writing credit on Cyborg. So he has worked for Chase. <gasps> oh, Goody. okay. So there's oh. that. But John, more importantly for you, is he is currently filming Bulletproof 2. Really? Yeah. It's supposed to come no out way. next year. Is it going to be... 
Is it going to be Dame or his kid? I, so nope. I kind of feel like it's his kid now. You're the only person on this recording that has seen that movie. So. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Are you kidding me? It, Adam Sandler and Damon Williams. Damon Wayans. I mean, that's just got watched me all. I'm like, what? <laughs> that was a real thing. It was, was a real thing. What am I thinking? It was of? great. James Caan was the bad guy. I've never seen that. <laughs> Oh, you guys are missing out. It was great. <laughs> like that was like Happy Gilmore era. Uh, oh, okay. Adam Sandler. I was thinking it was like and it was new. still funny. Oh, okay. So looking forward to that when Tremor Six comes out, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably going to get some angry emails about that Adam Sandler comment. <laughs> Before we get started, I can check in to what's going on in each other's lives. In Palace, you know, we're going to skip that section this week because. It's our inaugural, like, Because he war- can't say the word. No, I can't, also can't say the word. But <laughs> it is our inaugural relaunch of the podcast. And so what it is that we want is we really want to hear from you. If you like it, don't like it, recommend some changes. Want to tell us what you did like about it? Want to give us some movie recommendations? Email us, goWithTheHeat at gmail.com. Get us on Twitter at GoWithTheHeat. Facebook, go with the heat. Instagram, we're posting on there again. Go with the heat. You can ask on all those platforms and just message us and let us know what you think, what you think, where we should go, and what kind of movies we should watch. Because the goal is of this podcast is to talk about there's you know there's lots of podcasts out there about bad movies that they just take that bad movie and just rip it apart. We want to you know have some fun and poke some, and maybe poke some fun here and there. We've already done it with the writer and the director in the very beginning, but it's also because we seriously love these kinds of movies and we watch them. On purpose. This isn't because we want to watch yeah. it to do the podcast. It's because we love these movies. I mean, there is plenty to like. We are about to dive into some nudity and Bon Jovi to start this thing off. And I mean, I mean they we're like not that. messing around. <laughs> <laughs> well, without much further ado, let's go give this movie, Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man, a thorough go with the heat breakdown. When we open up, we're with Harley. I mean, it's it's Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man. There is no question on who Harley is supposed to be in this context. Now, I will say, Harley in this movie does not fit who I know of as being Harley Man in no. real life. Harley Man kind of looks like Dog the Bounty Hunter. Yes, not <laughs> not this not this way. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think like we're old dude that also eats at Applebee's but can't go back to Chili's. <laughs> Because <laughs> that, that one time when that thing happened. <laughs> to be fair, they did dress him like he bought all of his clothes from a Harley Davidson dealership. <laughs> Except for that V-neck half shirt he wears. That's a, that's from a woman's store. Because that doesn't fit him right. <laughs> that's a little tight for my... <laughs> one thing we noticed right away is that it is apparently... We're in the future, guys. It is not 1991. It is 1996. Which doesn't make any sense throughout the different. entire <laughs> movie. Why not only is this a movie about a Western and a motorcyclist, but also it's set in slightly in the future to make it sci-fi. But there's nothing in the future. There's nothing, nothing futuristic in it. The drugs and then... The, yeah, but I mean... The, I know. The, I know. I don't understand why it needs to also be a sci-fi movie. So he's inside the hotel room and he there's a naked woman on the bed. You know, like, like what happens? <laughs> he's packing up to leave his hooker after listening to on the radio. Now, he's not listening to it on purpose just to give us some backstory because this movie, as you will find out throughout the entire movie, has no time for backstory. You just get what's happening in the now, man. Except for Marlboro Man's dad. You hear a lot about Marlboro Man's dad about, about his old man. But otherwise, we've got no time for uh-huh. backstory. You're going to hear about this drug on the radio that is going, that's called Crystal Dream that you put into your eyeball. After he says goodbye to his hooker, he gets on his motorcycle and just starts riding west. He's just living the, the motorcycle dream. He's going to ride for hours and hours on the open road going through the desert. All the way out to California way. Bon Jovi playing. That he's a cowboy on a steel horse. He rides. Yeah, and it's great because it goes through like with the music and it builds up and you see like the setting that he's leaving and he's going out to Los Angeles. You like it really does put you in the mood for this movie. Now it'll take some turns really fast after this opening montage that leads up to the opening credits. But you're really into it. It's like there's these drugs and he's a motorcyclist that he's going to get on his steel horse and he's going to head out to California and you get these great panning shots of the desert landscape out on his way out there. And then as the credits roll, 
we get to his final stopping point inside of Los Angeles. But before we move on, this is our chance to check in with the guest stars in this movie, or the, the stars, uh, guest stars, of course, I have the stars of this movie. We're going to get into who it is that's actually in this movie, because it has got a stacked cast and you're right it is a stacked cast they spent 23 million dollars on this movie that was the budget in 1991 so that's this was kind of a little bit of a blockbuster in 1991 don johnson was a big name star of miami vice he's got his own album he banged sheena easton like he's pretty huge (laughs) at this point in time he almost didn't make it there like the the casting agents of Vice, they were nervous about him because he, before Vice, he had been in four failed TV pilots. Mm. Oh, that I didn't know. Mm-hmm. But thanks to a sci-fi cult classic, A Boy and His Dog, he got the nod, got the job on Vice. He actually had a pretty good career on TV. After Vice, he had a pretty long stretch on Nash Bridges, which according to a fact on IMBD, and I'm going to blame this on them if it's wrong, <laughs> it says that he co-wrote a two-hour movie with his then-neighbor, Hunter S. Thompson, what? and CVS eventually bought it and turned this, the story into Nash Bridges. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, I didn't know that they were neighbors, but I knew that Hunter S. Thompson was involved from the very, very beginning in Nashville. Don Johnson's still doing it. He, he's doing it for HBO's The Watchmen now. A couple other of his movies. I mean, uh, one of my... I, I saw Tin Cup the other day. That was one of my favorites. And he was also in Django Unchained. He plays a pretty good jerk. Yeah, we just recently watched Brawl and Cell Block 99. Same personality in that one. Although you mm-hmm. see him next to Vince Vaughn. There is quite a height difference between those two gentlemen. So Mickey Rourke. Dude, Mickey Rourke was an amateur boxer from 1964 to 1973. And he was damn good. He was 27 and 3 with 17 knockouts. Damn. And so and then he just he just retired mostly because he was starting to act. Early acting career was movies like Body Heat, Nine and a Half Weeks with Kim Basinger, where they pretty much just had sex everywhere. <laughs> Literally, right after he does this movie, Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man, he decides, you know what, I'm going to go back to boxing and I'm going to go pro. So from 1991 to 94, he would have eight fights. He would end up actually 6-0-2 with four knockouts. So it's not that, I mean, he was actually pretty good. Yeah. Once again, leave the ring and go back to acting. And actually, his later career has actually been pretty good. I mean, stuff like Sin City, The Wrestler. And then, I mean, even some fun movies like Domino and Iron Man 2 and Expendables. He's actually, I, I'd say his later career has actually probably been a little bit better. Yeah, he's. it, it makes more sense now that he was also a boxer. And that he's not uh, acting probably isn't his first thing, like his first passion, I guess. And so it makes sense, like, why there's these gaps now and when he disappeared, not including, you know, the drugs. The drugs probably saw some some, some, some gaps in there, too. Yeah. On a side note, this whole set, there was probably just oodles and oodles of drugs everywhere. (laughs) In fact, several of these guest stars were on Celebrity Rehab together. So oh, let's go move on to Chelsea Field. She plays Virginia Slim. She played Tila in the 1987 Masters of the Universe. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, she was in the Heat Man movie. She is actually in real life married to Scott Bakula. They've been together for like 16 years. She was in some other, you know, 90s action movies. She was in The Last Boy Scout in 1989 called Death Spa, which is about a woman who dies in a gym and possesses the exercise equipment. Equipment <laughs> and murders people with like the dumbbells and stuff okay. and i just had to mention that because that just sounds like an awesome movie yes send me a link to that that way i don't <laughs> okay. forget about that <laughs> okay she was also in flipper by the way <laughs> okay those are both great so she was in a crap ton of tv films and just guest stars like one or two episode guest stars but ultimately she ended up uh, she currently has a reoccurring role on Guess what? NCIS New Orleans with hmm. Scott Bakula. So now we move on to Daniel Baldwin, the second eldest brother. I was going to make fun of him, but reading about him, he actually sounds like the fun Baldwin. Most recently, he's had a radio show called the, the Daniel Baldwin Show in Syracuse, New York. 
from uh, 2017 to 2019. If we go back in time a little ways, he was Detective Bo Felton on Homicide Life on the Street. He was there from 93 to 95. Homicide Life on the Street gonna pop back up here. His character was killed off in 95. He was in movies like Born on the Fourth of July, Hero, and Moho and Drive. We could have been worse. We could have got Billy Baldwin. We'll just take our wins when we can get him. I saw he was in some TV movies, my favorite of which being Attack of the 50, 50 Foot Woman. <laughs> he also MCs for True TV Presents World's Dumbest. They do like Dumbest Criminal, Dumbest Skiers. So, but the reason why I say like he's probably the, the fun Baldwin. So in 1998, he was arrested running naked through the halls of the Plaza Hotel yelling, Baldwin! <laughs> Sounds like a fun guy. He was also <laughs> in Celebrity Rehab with Dr. Drew, who was, he was in there with Tom Sizemore, who was also in this movie. He plays Chance Wilder. Uh, he was also in Born on the Fourth of July. A couple Danny and Tom connections there. Maybe they have the same drug dealer. I don't know. Tom Sizemore's been in a ton of stuff. Passenger 57, Natural Born Killers, Heat, which he got the role over Don Johnson, by the way, in the movie Heat. Oh, interesting. Saving Private Ryan, Black Hawk Down, Point Break, Bringing Out the Dead. I could go on forever. He was in a movie in 2006 called Splinter with Edward James Elmos. On TV, he played Anthony Sinclair in the revival of Twin Peaks, which is the new like 2017 mm. one. Mm -hmm. He was a regular on USA's new show Shooter. He also did voice work for Grand Theft Auto Vice City. And he was the frontman for a Hollywood band called Day 8. Our next guest star is Giancarlo Esposito. Uh, Esposito. Uh, he plays Jimmy Giles. He was Gus from Breaking Bad and uh, Better Call Saul. He is a Vice veteran, too. Yeah, he was also in an episode of Vice. He's actually set to star in the upcoming The Mandalorian, which is mm. the new Star Wars Disney Star Wars Plus show. show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's actually going to be like the like the main star, but his career was actually made because of a bunch of Spike Lee movies he was in. He was in Do the Right Thing, School Days, Mo Better Blues, and Malcolm X. Outside of Spike Lee movies, he was also in the movie Fresh, The Usual Suspects, King of New York, and Maximum Overdrive. He played Tom Newville in the NBC show Revolution, which got canceled a little too soon. <laughs> he he was also on Homicide Life on the Streets, and he narrates Dear White People on Netflix. Our next guest star is Vanessa Williams, and she's not only in our stars, but she's also in our music. She is a singer, actress, fashion designer, and author. She gained recognition when she was crowned Miss America in 1984. She was actually the first African-American winner mm. of the Miss America pageant she had to resign a year later due to penthouse actually re un releasing some unauthorized nudes there was like this whole scandal i was just kind of bull on miss america pageants side because it's like it's not her fault that they got these nudes you yeah, know exactly. I, I guess 32 years later the ceo of uh miss america apologized so uh there's that yeah that's yeah it only it's took like 32 years yeah. Her first studio album dropped in 1988. It was called The Right Stuff. One of the songs, Dreamin', actually uh, got as high as number eight on the Hot 100. She'd have a number one hit with Save the Best for Last, uh, and ultimately would put out eight albums between 88 and 09. Damn, that is way more than I thought. She's been in movies like, like Eraser, Soul Food, Hoodlum. She was in the remake of Shaft in 2000. She's also been doing some voice work. There's some TV movies in there, 06 to 2010. She was in Ugly Betty. She's also on Desperate Housewives and some reality work as well with RuPaul's Drag Race. So yeah, pretty accomplished. We'll bring her up again in music. We've got a couple more guest stars. Our next one is Tia Carrera. She's an actress and singer. Her first big break was on the show the daytime soap general hospital most people know her from wayne's world and wayne's world 2 as playing yeah. cassandra yeah, she can really so lay she's out. hawaiian she's 52 and she is still hot by the way <laughs> uh she posed for nude in playboy in 03 and i might have to go dig that issue up i've seen it <laughs> oh oh uh, she also played Juno Skinner in True Lies. She voiced one of the main characters in Lilo and Stitch. And she actually has had a, a solid music career, but not the way you think. Her first album in 1993 would go platinum in the Philippines. 
Mm. She would also be signed to Don Ho's label. She would win several Grammys over the years for her Hawaiian music albums. I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, she was on the TV show Relic Hunter on Fox. She also did some reality stuff, too. Second season of Dancing with the Stars. She was on the fifth season of Celebrity Pr- Apprentice. But if you want to go all the way back to the beginning, the very first thing she ever did was she was eliminated in the first round as a singer on the 1985 Star Search. Oh, interesting. Yeah, she's a Star Search contestant. <laughs> well, she was. I mean, she lost. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so and I just want to throw an honorable mention out to Big John Studd, who is a former WWF wrestler. He plays Jack Daniels in this movie. That guy wrestled for like three decades. He was known for his matches with Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant. Uh, he's like wrestling royalty. He's six foot ten and three hundred sixty four pounds. So he's based. He's almost a. He's over a foot taller than Don Johnson. Yeah, <laughs> that's why they don't put them next to each other. <laughs> Mm -hmm. unfortunately he passed away in 95 from cancer they found it after a match in 93 and then our last guest star is Eloy Casados he plays Jose he's best known for playing Ishii on Ishii the last of his tribe he also played Sheriff Sam Coyote in Walker Texas Ranger and of course in Walker Texas Ranger his sheriff Native American partner would be named Sam Coyote of course (laughs) So he appeared in 20 films and 30 TV shows, and I, I I did not go into Die, but I'm sure some of those TV shows, more than a few, he's playing a Native American. <laughs> but the ones, the stuff where he wasn't, he was also in movies like White Men Can't Jump and Play It to the Bone. He, I, I appreciate in this movie that it's not just Harley Davidson and the Marvel, that it's Virginia Slim and mm-hmm. Jose Cuervo mm-hmm. and Jack Daniels and like the, the entire... Yeah. Which makes me want to go back to the writer and be like, did you write this like seriously? Did you think they were going to make this into a movie? Or you're like, you had you said to turn in the script. Yeah, they're like, and, and whatever, you're I like, whatever. It's called, I just gave him all these names. And I figured you would change them later. And then they filmed the movie. And I'm like, wait, no, you were supposed to change the yes. names. Why do they have these names in the movie? Yes. <laughs> and what's great is like, they didn't ask for any permission or anything. No. <laughs> That's why they have to run the disclaimer at the beginning. This is no not affiliated with any brands. And we were not given permission for any of this. Our breakdown as we move into our breakdown of the movie is going to be a little different than how we did with Miami Vice, where we're not going to go deep scene by scene. We're going to kind of skim over stuff and then get to the scenes where we want to spend some more time talking about it. We're going to go like skim, 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 and then deep dive. Just FYI, if, if you're looking for a full scene by scene breakdown, you don't got four hours to go into it because there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of great stuff in this movie. Lots of moments where I wish, <laughs> you know, where we could pause. So just keep that in mind as we go through. When Harley Davidson gets into LA, he stops off at a gas station, shows off his karate skills, you know, because it's, it's 1991. So all the people in the 80s who learned karate to, to, to be able to defend themselves on the street, they can't stop themselves sometimes. They have to. There's like a robbery happening, so he's got to, you know, got to do his karate. <laughs> Just acts like this is like an everyday thing. Like, damn it, every time I go into a 7-Eleven, I got to deal with this. You know? <laughs> I think it's funny that, like, really early in the movie, they come back from the credits, and the first two scenes are, we've got to show you how tough Harley Davidson and Don Johnson are by both of them getting in fights. And Harley then never lives up to that no. fighting ability, or especially when he has a gun. He doesn't live up to it for the rest of the movie, which I appreciate that we're supposed to be. He's hardcore. He's going to beat you up, and he can handle his own, except for against other people who also can fight. Yeah, or have guns. <laughs> <laughs> because what this movie is really about, and I know there's Harley Davidson, and Harley Davidson gets the top billing, and Mickey Bork also gets the top billing in the uh, credits when it, yes, when it, when it comes in. Did. The real story of this movie is Don Johnson as the Marvel World Man. Yes. And when we go into that mm-hmm. bar, is bar strip club? I don't know. Question something? mark? <laughs> Buffet? No, <I'm> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, may, they might just be customers with their boobs out. Who knows? <laughs> I think it's a strip club because they call her a stripper in the credits. Stripper All I know bike. is it's by the airport. <laughs> For all your needs. <laughs> Meanwhile, so so Marlin, uh, Marlin, 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 Marlboro Man, <laughs> Marlin Man, <laughs> Marlboro Man is taking on an entire tribe of Native Americans at pool. It's not racist though. <laughs> no, he didn't say anything racist no. in it. <laughs> and I 
wrote down a note saying I'm disappointed that Marvel Man doesn't have a Jamaican accent, but I'm actually kind of disappointed he also doesn't have like a Texas accent. I know he should have had a Texas accent. He still has his Florida accent. <laughs> There's a fight. This is when we see that they're both able to, to fight, although Marwell Man... Doesn't he, help. Uh, he, well, Marwell Man gets in, into his fight, and the guy pulls a knife on him, and he's able to win that fight, but, like, barely. Also, he's, like, holding people back while... Yeah, that's true, yeah. <laughs> Har- Harley Davidson is, like, just watching. You know? Yeah. So then, uh, here's the moment that where I really want to stop, because we're going to come back to this thing, is this billboard. When they spend the time, where they sit up on that billboard. Mm-hmm. Now, do you, do you think that they do that because it's LA and that that's <laughs> it's a problem in LA like if you ever driven through, through LA they have barbed wire on the bottom and the top of all the road know. signs and billboards I was so confused because I was trying to read too much into what was on the billboard like is that like foreshadowing uh, something's going to happen in the future or like, I don't know I, I was just confused that they would leave a bar go sit on a billboard and then go to another bar could you have this conversation in the bar or in the parking lot like why did you have to climb up on the billboard well they had to run away though <laughs> they had to get out of that bar though. that's what I'm saying they're going to come we're going to come back to this place because at the very end of the movie they come back to the same billboard and they're sitting up on it and we, we hear like the notes between like the end of the first bar scene to the first of the next bar scene and like it has they've been two years since they've seen each other and like they're kind of catching up with the things that are going on harley is eating eating straight out of the can which if you ask me the cowboys should probably be doing that not the harley Davidson guy yeah i don't know about that (laughs) (laughs) it's also when harley says he feels like he's living for a higher purpose and that he not necessarily found god but he needs to find some way to get into heaven which is again something that comes up in the beginning of the movie but then doesn't deliver at the end no there's no there's nothing that ever happens in fact he this should be don johnson saying that because he's the one that has the epiphany like throughout the movie like i'm a bad person (laughs) and i gotta change the way i'm living (laughs) Uh, and not Harley, because he's like, eh. <laughs> I mean, you well, know, not to spoil it, but a lot of stuff happens and he doesn't care. <laughs> but I, I think the thing is, is that we're supposed to try and take it like maybe it doesn't come off, but they're borderline. Like these guys are criminals, like they steal motorcycles, they're punks. And and I don't know if it comes off like because Don Johnson's, you know, he's hustling these guys as a pole shark throughout the movie. They, you know, they steal a motorcycle and think we're, we're supposed to think of them as criminals. And then, like, this experience changes them, I think. But and that's why I think it's interesting is that in the very beginning, they have this billboard scene where Harley is saying, I'm going to change my ways because I need a way to get into heaven. Where then Marlboro Man doesn't see it that way. Mm-hmm. But then by the end, he's the one that does see it that way. And Harley's like, yeah, kill him. Yeah. He's also like, bye, see you later. <laughs> like, <"Just gonna> <laughs> yeah. So after this fantastic billboard scene, which is going to come up again, we go to the bar in which they're going to, all of their friends are, which you don't definitely do not get that sense in the very beginning when you come into the second bar. It's got an airplane stuck in it. And also when they pull up, there's, <laughs> there's, there's three great things that happen at this bar, <laughs> like right away. One, you find out that basically all of Burbank is an airport and there's like the futuristic plane, which is actually one of those um, Lufthansa planes, like one of the ones that aren't in service anymore. I'm drawing a total blank on what their names are. They could fly faster. They no, I don't know what they are. Yeah. From the from England to, to the United States. Anyways, they're like these smaller, but they fly really fast. But yeah. they're out of service now. Oh. That's that's landing oh. at the airport. Let's just remind you, this is a sci-fi movie. This isn't a regular movie. Remember, we're set in the future. This is a sci-fi movie. Two, we're in air- the future. <laughs> <laughs> Two, there's an airplane stuck in the top of this bar. And inside, when they talk to Pops, when Harley goes and talks to Pops, there's a newspaper above his head that says an airplane had crashed into the bar, but they stayed open. So that's a real airplane that, that's supposed to have crashed in, into yeah. that bar. And it's just like, now it's just a, a talking point for the bar. <laughs> yes. Pilot's it's- still up there. Place smells a little bit. <laughs> And then the third greatest thing that happens in the bar, which a lot of great things happen in this bar, including the arm wrestling, which we're going to come back. But the third greatest thing mm-hmm. is that there's a payphone that you put in a special code and it signals the person on the other side to open the door to the secret room yes. where Jose is and he's deaf. So, <laughs> so how does the code work? <laughs> <laughs> so I have, have a feeling that that's just where they, they put him. He's like out of sight, out of mind kind of thing. It's like lock him in this little room that's behind this so, payphone. I, I think we should, I got to say something. I don't think he's deaf. I think he had something happen to him because if you look at his neck, he's got a gigantic scar that goes across his neck. So mm. remember how we're like, how come no one's signing for ah. Jose? I think he's not deaf. I think he's had an accident. He's mute. 
he's a mute. And that's why yeah. he's kind of like signs kind of not really sign language. It's it's kind of just like gestures and stuff. That makes way more sense. Because he could, the whole movie, no one's signing for him. So he can't, there's no way he could be deaf unless he's really good at reading lips when they're turned opposite <laughs> of him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Huh. So I think no, that makes he, way more sense because that actor, I thought I was like just, maybe, yeah, that actor had that scar. I'm like, oh, that actor have a scar like that? And I looked at him and I was like, no, he doesn't. So it's gotta be, it's like a huge scar that goes across his neck. So like he has an injury. See, I was, I was distracted because the movie suddenly turned into over the top and <laughs> I know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, big John stud arm wrestling, whoever that guy was, man, it other dude was massive too. This and, and this scene is great because you see Harley eyeing Vanessa Williams. He's eyeing Lulu while she's performing. And then there's the arm wrestling and then big John sees Harley and it's like, I'm going to kill you because, because he cheated with the wife, with uh-huh. his wife. Lulu and Harley had a thing for a while. And then he throws him out a window and then jumps on him from the window into the car. And like, Harley's dead. He's punching him hard. Too. This 400 pound dude mm-hmm. just jumped out of a second story window on top of his head. <laughs> He's, <dead. laughs> He's beating him up. And, and Harley says, listen, man, he, she's always loved you. Even when we were boning. Yeah, it basically. was always you first, <laughs> and then like, are you serious? Like, yeah, I'm serious. And Big John's like, okay, or Jack, Jack's like, I'm sorry, and they hug. Yeah, but he's like, why'd you do that to me, man? You were like a brother to me. I loved you, and you you treated me. And I was like, man, that's really bad, actually. <laughs> and then All right, but to- let's get down to brass tax, brass tax, guys. We're gonna lose the bar, so let's start brainstorming on ideas about how to save the bar. <laughs> So, see, can we take out a loan? No. Bake sale. No. no. Uh, yeah. But what about better marketing? What if we have a, uh, what if we print some flyer? No, no. Well, I guess the only thing left to do is to rob an armored car. I mean, that, that's the logical thing. Like, the fact that Harley is like, I have an idea and I know what it is. And Marble Man's like, I know what he's talking about. He wants to rob a bank, like, before he even says it. It tells me that they were thinking about this before the bar was in trouble. This is seriously the best moment in this movie. Not just in the opening or in the beginning or anything like that. This is the best moment in this movie because we learn a whole bunch of things. Yeah. One, if we just solidify, this movie is about Marlboro Man and he's literally holding all of the sexy. And that's not just because Don Johnson is attractive, but just to talk about everyone else that's in the movie. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Except for, sorry, Vanessa Williams and Tia Carrera. But everyone else, mm. Don Johnson is holding all of the male. Yes, the male, sexy. the male sexy is all coming from him, <laughs> and those very, very, very tight pants he wears. Lulu, then, while they're talking, I don't about know. This, I saw nine and a half weeks. <laughs> Lulu then comes and gets Jack, and like berates him. Talk about him. an odd couple. <laughs> but you see that look that Marlboro Man gives her, and then Jack after like how he hears how she's talking to him. Like, oh, this is a man's movie because, and and really, we're rarely going to see women throughout this entire exactly, movie. Yeah. Women are, this is a boys club movie, mm-hmm. and all the boys are going to play their games, and women need to know their place. Now, that might be because he's supposed to be a cowboy, but then the, when women just disappear <laughs> from the movie yeah. <laughs> for huge gaps in time, that might be what it is. But my favorite part is that you see how Jack is beating up on Harley, and there's the arm wrestling, and then the guy who's overseeing the armistice government's all crushed when he sees that the other guy lost yeah like he's that. like you were supposed to <laughs> you find out at this moment that it's all staged yeah the whole <laughs> thing <laughs> how are they in the hole they're literally rigging gambling <laughs> inside of their bar <laughs> and then yes they come up with this plan from this out-of-towner and say let's rob a bank yeah who's gonna be like i'm just gonna rob this bank and then i'm gonna leave so I'm not going to have any of the consequences. You're going to have to deal with that. Not me. <laughs> They're going to rob the bank that holds the note for, for <laughs> the place. Like the, That's where they can't get the loan. And the, the bank is the one who wants to foreclose on it because they want to, like, it's going to, they can get more for it because it's in the zone of the airport and all that stuff. Like, they're going to rob that bank. <laughs> so instead of, like, this long time, because, like I said, this movie does not care about backstory. No, and they don't care about action. There couldn't be another scene with them planning it. We're just going to jump to it. <laughs> okay, we got it. Jose works on the roads. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very complicated plan, too, because they have, like, not only all the cones and the, the, the coordinates so the truck goes to a certain spot, but then the their getaway vehicle is underground mm-hmm. so they can drive away in the aqueduct. It's a very complicated plan. We didn't need to know any and about that. When they actually do the robbery, how they set the cones up is great because he basically does them in a big triangle to him in sitting in the manhole. 
So essentially to just block off the road and bring them right to him. Yep. It just looks so ridiculous being someone who who does construction to see the different <laughs> ways he does the codes. Uh, it goes off really well. And it, that's not the part that we want to talk about. The robbery goes fine, whatever. The Brinks or armored vehicle drivers are very helpful to like just giving a play by play on what the audience is supposed to get on their own. Yeah. They're just going to say it out loud. And for they're, you. they're not impressed. They're not afraid. They're not like. These armored guards are, like, making fun of them as they're doing it. (laughs) (laughs) Also, I do appreciate that Don Johnson and Mickey Work, they're like, we can't give you a change of wardrobe. You have to be the Marlboro Man and the Harley Davidson Man as you're robbing these people. All the time. (laughs) All the time. Like, and literally, we don't have any other clothes for you. You're a cowboy, (laughs) but you have no change of clothes. (laughs) Like, I thought you were, I'm in disguise. The man was dressed like a cowboy with a scarf around his neck. (laughs) Everything goes off with a hitch until, like, the Matrix guys show up. They kind of remind me of the Nihilist from, uh, um... Yes, from from Big Lebowski. (laughs) The Matrix with big asses, you mean. (laughs) Yes. So, um... (laughs) But luckily, Big John pops out of a... A manhole. Where is there a manhole they, big enough for him? Come on. And they escape through the manhole, which is just the greatest the escape from a robbery to climb down the manhole. No, doesn't he ride uh, his motorcycle in and then light it on fire? Mm-hmm. There we go. And then he goes down the manhole. Oh, yeah, yeah, for the diversion. Long story short, they get away from the nihilists because clearly it, it takes a long time to climb down with that kind of a jacket, <laughs> trench coat that they're wearing. Every time you forget that this is a sci-fi movie, they bring in just enough to remind you, hey, by the way, this is a sci-fi movie. This isn't a, a cowboy movie. This isn't a robbery movie. This is a sci-fi movie. I did not get that. In the, like, I understood about the airplane, but when I saw a guy's walking... With like the the plastic trench coats, I did not get that that was sci-fi. I was like, oh, so they're in a gang. Like it's a really stupid gang. This is like something out of the yeah. Warriors. They have matching outfits. Well, <laughs> they have roller skates too. <laughs> That's the problem. It's like the, the the whole time in all the scenes they're wearing those matching outfits, and like it wasn't until the end that I realized like, oh, they're supposed to be bulletproof. Yeah, I didn't get it either until you said like, oh, they're bulletproof. I'm like, oh, that's why they wear them. They look like they have two men in there, right? Like like two men standing <laughs> on top of each other. <laughs> like like was, you want to yeah, sneak like into the movie theater the, or something, you know? <laughs> two kids standing on each other's yeah, shoulders. Exactly. <laughs> Like, is that a man or is that two fat kids standing on top of each other? <laughs> so they do get away. And then when they get to the their little hideout, which is at this airplane recycling facility, like, apparently they can just drive in wherever they want to and no one will ever find them. If I don't, they didn't steal money, but they actually stole pure crystal dream. Or just some blue cubes. <laughs> Drugs, guys. It's Vice. We're back, baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Abandoned airfield. <laughs> drugs like, this I is sh- one big vice episode i swear to god there is a potential there's a fan fiction that you could write to say that sonny crockett leaves the uh-huh. florida police the miami police force goes mm-hmm. and just roams the country on his motorcycle becomes like this cowboy guy just yeah. like doing and then to survive he just does like these little like heist so heist, yeah. yeah yeah he like robs some people like he doesn't do anything really bad he just like does some robberies and stuff stuff like that to kind of stay alive and he just turns into this drunk punk that kind of just cruises around then finds himself right back in 2d and then where's tub though yeah. <laughs> uh he had a state fair in <laughs> vermont that he's performing at real fast at the trust bank we finally see tom sizemore you realize he's a baby <laughs> He's baby Tom Sizemore. He's so young. <laughs> he just finds out that his crew is terrible because these amateurs are able to escape. Well, he says they must not be amateurs because they are able to escape Dana Vault. I mean, well, with that ass, he can't go anywhere. <laughs> he can't run with that <laughs> that bottom half he's got. Back at the airplane bar, Marlboro's trying to relax. It's been a long day. They had, you know, real serious bank robbery. They ended up not getting them any cash. They got to figure out how to become drug dealers now, but they don't want to become drug dealers. But, you know, just in case you forgot, they're also two sexy men. So Honey comes over and says, hey, Harley, can you give me a ride home? And then Marlboro immediately says, hey, can I borrow your motorcycle? <laughs> yeah. He's like, but I can't. <laughs> He's like, Can I, I have to give Honey a ride home. He's like, well, get a cab. Like, I don't have any money. <laughs> this scene, too, is like we are reminded that Vanessa Williams is all, is also in this movie, and then we never see her again. <laughs> yeah, she's in the background. Many questions yep, about a, that. <laughs> she's singing. She's the loud singer. She's singing. And then it, that, that's about it. Sorry, this she's might gone. be the last scene that she's in. It is, it is the last mm-hmm. scene. 
Yeah, it is. And so in this exchange, Harley is also talking more about like, I want to clean up. And here's this woman that we had a good thing. And then one day I woke up and she was just gone. And it shows the picture of her. I mean, you know, it's not going to ruin anything with honey. That, you know, all that's still good. Honey's sticky and sweet or whatever she calls herself. <laughs> Leaves a taste in your mouth, you know, kind of like sweat. But <laughs> And Marble Man decides, you know what, I'm going to go out. And I'm going to go ride on my motorcycle. I, he, why, why did he want to borrow it again? Because did he is say gone. he wanted to go see Virginia? No, he just had to kind of borrow your motorcycle. That's why okay. he said he didn't say why. And he just happens to ride by this police officer, does a wheelie, flips them off, and then leads them on this crosstown chase. And it looks very, very familiar, chase and all the roads and everything, to a movie I had literally like just turned on like the day before. It turns out like maybe a lot of chases happened in the same tunnels across LA <laughs> <laughs> for movies. <laughs> so it looked an awful like the chase scene in the opening on Lethal Weapon 2. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> chasey, okay. chasey, and then sexy, sexy. Yeah, okay, but yeah. it's kind of weird that there's no actual sex in this movie did you find that strange there's a lot of nudity right i mean a lot of breasts <laughs> no penises though <laughs> <laughs> damn <laughs> yeah so but there's no sex there's no actual it's like it's no, not even like cinemax sex you yeah. know where it's like they're, they're well doing i mean it, this is kind of a like dear penthouse <laughs> arrest <laughs> This is great because there's this chase scene that ends up at this house, which the house is weird because it's got a garage, but then one side of the garage just doesn't have a wall. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I saw a house when we were looking, when we thought we were going to move, and it had that. It was the garage opened, and there was nothing there. It was just like a false wall. I'm like, what the, what's the point? <laughs> Someone could just walk it's around and get your garage. car. It's yeah. like a carport with no top, though. Yeah, exactly. It, that's exactly what this is. This is a carport with a garage door, but it's got the and the carports. If, if it's had a roof and a garage door, that's it. But this didn't have a roof. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. It was literally just a garage door and no side. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> what I love about this is a the conversation with Virginia, where she says after bone and like I'm getting married. I mean, after they bone, yeah. you got to get the boning in first. I, I'm engaged. I have a fiance. So I can't wait for you anymore. I wanted you, but I love you. Mm -hmm. Because Jill, I love you, but I can't wait around for you. Yeah. Two. Remember uh, what you remember in the very, very beginning of this movie. Harley is, you know, doing some questionable things. Decides to come out west for whatever reason. They haven't seen each other in two years. But he decides to come out. Gets in that fight at the Seven Eleven. He wins easily. He plans that whole robbery yeah. and then s somehow at after the robbery he loses like half of his brain he stops being able to function like a normal human being <laughs> yeah, after that because in this morning we see him cooking he's burning toast and putting coca-cola in whatever meat thing that he's cooking yeah it's like a steak yeah. or something he's unable to function as a human being any longer i don't think he could ever function as a I think he's doing that crystal dream. I think he put it in his eye. <laughs> <laughs> and she obviously knows him. And she's like, what are you doing? Why are you burning down my house? And he's like, let's, let's let Marbo eat that. <laughs> they go out to a diner. That's when he finds out about crystal dream uh, with donut. All over his face. Yeah, he's a, such a slob. I told you. He was fine in the beginning, and he just slowly degrades throughout the entire movie. Yeah, he can't, like, it's like he can't function. He's like, he, it's like he took the donut and smashed his face with it. <laughs> he like, at the end of the movie, he turns into a child. We finally address what they stole. Got these drugs, they got no money. So now it's like, well, let's ransom the drugs back to the drug dealer we stole it from for his money. Which just seems, seems like a terrible place. Plan because you already robbed <laughs> this man once. Yeah, no. And now you want to now you want to blackmail or, or ransom him because you stole the wrong thing. <laughs> I don't know what they're thinking because they just walk into the bank and be like, "Hey, it's us that have your drugs. Give us yeah. two point five million dollars." And more romance like this is probably a bad idea. We probably shouldn't do this, and that doesn't stop the. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and what's great is that Tia Pereira, she leads them in and takes them into this office and leaves them. And it's like a fake office where they're like watching them through a camera. But Sizemore is clearly in the same building because then Tia goes up and she's standing right next to him. So it's like, wait a minute. So this bank just has this random fake <laughs> office that they put people in. Does this happen a lot? God damn, we got robbed again. They want to ransom it. We got to put them in the ransom room. <laughs> Why don't they just kill them now? Yeah, they. I think because they don't know yet where the money is. Like where, where the drugs where are. Where the drugs are. Yeah, mm -hmm. they don't know yet. That's why they need. They actually mm. need them to come meet and do all that. So they, you know, they're. 
But, but what's he paying Danny Baldwin for? Like, can't he beat it out of him? He's got the special <laughs> trench coat mafia with him. He can't. He spends a lot of time on his hair. It is like perfectly <laughs> cold. <laughs> so then it's that night. And I, I seriously think only like 24 hours have passed. No, I know. I think it's like, that, exactly. Mm-hmm. They were getting this shit done. Because <laughs> yeah, that like, night, <laughs> then they fly in with their helicopter to make their drug deal and do the exchange of the money for the drugs. And then yes. Marlboro Man, and, or sorry, Harley mm-hmm. thinks that this is all And Marlboro Man's like, this was too easy. We're not pros. We're amateurs. Yeah, which, Why would they do this? And they're like, they even gave us the dollar wanna, we asked for. Mm-hmm. Suspicious. Danny Baldwin, the drug deal via a helicopter, which I think is damn baller. <laughs> I think he just lives like, in there, though. I think he's flying. <laughs> How much like, money? Has helicopter landed ever? <laughs> well, it, they asked for what two two point five million renting the helicopter and the paying the pilot. He probably spent fifty grand just to roll through there to drop that money off. But is he dropping bodies out of there? Because that's <laughs> that's really utilizing <laughs> it. <laughs> As keep coming back to Marlboro Man, his story is solid. His character stays consistent throughout the entire movie. Yeah, now, he talks about his dad. He talks about how he's like a rambling man. His basically. personality stays yeah. the same. And that's probably credit to Don Johnson as the actor because the rest of the actors in this movie are actors. But they're well, not known I mean, for being like great actors. Mickey, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We're just hurting in here. <laughs> I really think they wrote this. The They wrote Marlboro Man. And it was like, oh shit, we got to write parts for a whole bunch of other people too <laughs> <laughs> no i really do think i think you're right i think like it's not it's not and i'm not saying mickey work's not a good actor i just think this that this character was not that well written which is ironic because he got top billing he should be the more well, poignant person but he's not <laughs> he's supposed to be the badass biker but i don't think they wrote him correctly to be that like he should have been like beating up the trench coat guys and throwing them around he's you know like a soft too mm-hmm. Yeah, most of the movie, he's running and just kind of following Don Johnson's lead. They don't really sh- portray him as being like a, a tough guy biker, as just being kind of his doting friend. I think if if we had, if what we're saying here is, is that we should make, have a remake mm-hmm. and still have Don Johnson be a Marlboro man, but have The Rock be oh a Harley. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would watch that. And so in this bar scene where they feeling like they've done everything that they're supposed to do like yeah, they they're got done. the money they're yeah. gonna save for yeah. everything is done but now marlboro man he's like this is too easy and and that's true throughout this uh, up in this movie up to this point like everything has been really easy mm-hmm. to be honest with you it's actually kind of boring up to this point because it was like it's just so by the numbers like yeah. they robbed it it worked out it's fine mm-hmm. yeah i think mm-hmm. but then obviously it escalates very quickly R- really more quickly than i thought it was gonna escalate and, i thought it was gonna drag out yeah <laughs> yeah this, this yeah things change great. quickly yeah this scene is great because they're talking to pops the the trench coat mafia come in and they're looking for the guys right they're looking yeah. for a, a harley and marble man and jose and jack and, and everyone and else yeah, and they're all the watching robbery. behind yeah. like a two-way mirror yep and pops is just out there and this scene is great and this is exactly why we watch these kind of movies because this movie was kind of boring by the numbers you know whatever it's just a poorly written action movie and then you get that moment when trench coat number one stops and looks in the mirror and aims the gun at pops and pulls the trigger and like because he just knew that they were there the entire time in that moment of him just like staring into the window and then pulling the trigger and just murdering pops and then shooting through the mirror and literally killing everyone else except for Harley and Marlboro Man. Yeah. Well, yeah. Because Jack mm-hmm. survives for like a couple minutes, but he ends up, in the end, <laughs> yeah. he's a large target. <laughs> yeah. It's such a brutal scene, too. Because like at, at the beginning of the scene, it's Harley and Marlboro. But all these characters we've been introduced to, you're starting to like. Like, I'm starting to like Big John. Everybody's dead. And then like they're on their own and they're running. It is. It's so brutal. And the movie never recovers from it because they could never I live up to that scene again. I didn't like the only thing I didn't like about that scene is that yes, it was really brutal, but they didn't. I don't think they portrayed it like they they didn't act like they were upset. Mm-hmm. Like obviously, I know mm-hmm. later on they talk about it. And John, he's like, we just lost our friends. Mm-hmm. But they're so nonchalant, like, while it's happening. They're, like, joking back and forth while people are getting murdered around them. Like, like your best yeah. friends, like, they're supposed to be friends since high school. That's what they said when they come to the bar. Like, yeah. they've known each other since high school. So you're telling me, like, you it, saw Jose and Jimmy and, and Pops, who you, like, love like a dad, and he raised you. You wouldn't rob the bank for the man, but you're like, eh, Pops <laughs> is dead. 
and that's the other thing that's kind of weird about the movie too is like you think the original plot is they're gonna rob a bank to save the bar and like that's the whole plot of the movie but that's only half the movie because at this point now the bar is gone all the friends are gone pops is gone like there's no bar anymore now it's it's running from a drug dealer to survive. And, like, that's the whole second part of this movie. Because it ends up being at the end of the movie. It's like, oh, that these two hooligans are finally going to do the right thing. Like, it took killing all of their friends and all this stuff to happen for them trying to be like, you know, we're going to be decent people. But I don't understand. Like, I don't understand that they're not, they don't, what they do doesn't change anything in the end. It doesn't make them better people because they don't, <laughs> they come back great, but the people are still dead and you don't get the bar back and you never know what happens. To, like, what happened to Lulu? She has nothing now. <laughs> yeah, she has no job or husband. <laughs> or dad. I think with like a uh-huh. grandpa or something. <laughs> or brother. Her brother's yeah, dead. Yeah, uh, we <laughs> never see anything with, really with the women. Uh, I guess his cop friend lived happily ever after with the guy who made Sergeant. <laughs> Real fast here, we have chased by the trench coat mafia to hide in the bottom of an airplane. The dog sees everything. That poor poodle. <laughs> Speedy was like, I was just going to go on a trip. <laughs> and then they end up in Vegas. They murdered like three people at the airport and the plane still took off on time. <laughs> Talk about being in the 90s, apparently. Right, yeah, then they got to Vegas. It got out of the out of the luggage cargo area and everything was fine. I you thought know, about that too. My no goodness. one asked any questions. <laughs> You were the person they held hostage in the cargo area. <laughs> hey, she knew what happened. She she knew that they were trying to save her. All she knows is that there was two people. There was someone hunting them. Yeah. Doesn't know that like they're actually good. They had guns and like held her hostage <laughs> in the cargo area of the plane. She yes. held hostage by Don Johnson. She doesn't need to complain. Okay. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Don Johnson was trying to choke her out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hey, there are worse ways to go. <laughs> Mickey Rourke could have tried to choke her out. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, why isn't the tough guy handling the physical work? Nope. <laughs> then, then they're in Vegas just staying at a hotel, and Harley is like, okay, well, we're done. Everyone's dead, and like, let's just go about our merry way, and Marble Man can't, can't handle that. And you learn a little bit more that like Marble Man lives there. He's actually from Nevada, from Vegas. Like, and Harley Man, Harley Man, Harley Man. Harley's like, you're from Vegas? And he's like, yeah, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> that's actually no, one of my favorite me. that's one of my favorite conversations because harley tells him he, he goes i didn't know real shit kicking rodeo cowboys came from vegas and then he tells him about how the room reminds him of a time when he banged a fat girl named annie in Mesquite, he lost Texas. his virginity to her she popped, yeah, his, he cherry. popped his cherry with her <laughs> this is a great conversation like this is a total Total guy friends like best friends conversation. Yeah, oh, meanwhile, yeah, all, all their friends are dead though. <laughs> <laughs> but even still, Marble's like, you know, I can't handle you anymore. I'm going downstairs. He goes and he calls Virginia, and that's when he sees some thick boys coming in. <laughs> Damn thick boy. <laughs> and this is when we get that scene too, where he, where Baldwin gets out of the elevator <laughs> and he turns. And he's looking he smuggles some fine <laughs> hams in his jacket. <laughs> <laughs> he looks like he's carrying Pineapples. <laughs> Only in the bottom region, though. <laughs> He's wearing a fake ass. I'm telling you, it's two kids, and the one on the bottom is fat, okay? <laughs> They're stacked on top of each other. <laughs> Either that or it's like a horse costume. There's someone in the bottom. <laughs> oh. We both couldn't handle it when we saw that part when he came out. Like, oh my god, why is he so oh thick? <laughs> what does he have in there? <laughs> why is it they... why is it all chase scenes end up on the roof like how come no one ever goes to the basement or goes to the <laughs> parking garage like run out like, of the like, building why are you going up you can't get out <laughs> yeah so they end up on the roof and they decide they chase them behind and they're hiding behind an ac unit or something and they're getting shot at and harley's like hey let's just jump down to the pool which is like 15 stories down and marble man's like hell no like you're crazy and so harley goes screw you i'm doing it anyway and sucker punches him and then jumps <laughs> off the roof and it's like why was the sucker punch necessary he's not trying to keep you from jumping off the roof because earlier in this in the scene he punch marble man punches him he's like don't you even care that our friends are dead he punches him in the mouth before he leaves the room 
So I think he felt like this was the perfect time. We're going to die anyway. I'm going to punch you before I jump in the pool. <laughs> <laughs> and that's also when you discover that Marble Man said, like, they, they have to have, like, a special coated jacket or something because these bullets are not going through them. And they're like, oh, that's why it looks like that. <laughs> so, of course, after they jump into the pool. The they're next- fine, though. They survived the fall. It, they're totally fine. Belt, belly flop and all into the pool. Yeah, I mean, did, wouldn't you, like, break your spine or something by doing that? I mean, from that height? Yeah. Yeah, probably. <laughs> but mm-hmm. naturally, what you do is, is you catch the rails, and you go across the country where? by train. Okay, but where are there rails in, like, downtown Vegas? <laughs> <laughs> Does the downtown have, like, a train that goes through there, and I didn't know? Because they had to walk a long way to get to that. <laughs> <laughs> and this Maybe they movie... weren't actually in Vegas. Maybe it was Greeno. <laughs> yeah, true. True, true. This movie does this thing where it flips back and forth sometimes. What it's doing is, is like, I bet you could cut the movie and only have the, the Western parts. And when it's a Western part, they're doing Western things. And yeah. so, like, they're, li- they're riding they're the rails. Riding the rails. And, and Marvel uh-huh. Man has, like, a big moment where he talks about his feelings and mm-hmm. the, doing the right thing. And, and he has this, this big moment and then jumps out of the train. Because it's his theme. He's like, uh-huh. it's been his thing. Yeah. Whereas, like, being in the city is supposed to be, like, Harley, and he's like, I got a god. I think uh-huh. it yeah, Harley is one sit on the billboard, he's mm-hmm. one going to the bar, and, like, st- stuff like that. But then when it's Marlboro's thing, it's something Western, like, what would be, like, classic Western-based. Yeah. He even goes and tries to get the girl back. He goes, shows up, pounds on the door. Is Gina here? <laughs> Wait, no, I'm sorry, that would be Sonny Crockett. Um, you mean Caitlin. <laughs> Caitlin. They're gonna go back. Marvel Man wants to go back, and he wants to avenge his friends. I guess, and he also says well, they have the money. So that's like that's another key thing. They still have the money, and so he's like, we should go back and we avenge our friends. We should make it right. Like they're gonna get back. I think they're gonna give the money to somebody for the bar or something. That's what he's trying to say. And at this point in time, the movie could have ended at any scene. Yeah, like, I mean, we, we could have just ended it at any <laughs> scene. Could have ended it with them on the train. We could have ended it with when he goes back and talks to Virginia. We could have ended it right there inside of the bank when they have their final moment, but it's a, it's, it just keeps going. I was disappointed in the Virginia stuff. Like, why even include it if he's not going to end up with her? Great. So she, she, she stayed with the boring lieutenant that's half bald. Okay, we get it. <laughs> hey, hey, he just made sergeant last Monday. <laughs> he looks way older than her. And also, what kind of man sticks around with the woman who he knows is having sex with another man all the time? Because he knows who he is. He's like, mm. oh, so you're a Marlboro. <laughs> Yeah, I know. That was that was my thought. Like he clearly knows who he is. So after he goes and talks to Virginia and Harley shows up, we have another billboard moment. You gotta fix his boot. Yes. He talks about his dad, that you know, his old man is he refers to him constantly throughout the entire movie about why he wears those old boots, says dad gave them to him. It's the only thing he ever gave him. Harley also says he has never shot anyone or at, even at a person before, mm-hmm. up until very recently. Um, which I, he's not good with handling a gun. He has a gun accident no. waiting to happen at any point in time. Yeah, no, he's not good at all. <laughs> Unlike Marvel Man, he's a, he can shoot really well because he's a cowboy. Cowboy. And then they put the coin back together, which they figured out was the tracking device. And then it suddenly pops up the blinky thing, starts doing the thing in the helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> because the helicopter has been going for two days straight, just circling around That's everywhere. great. <laughs> yeah, they're way. all piled in the helicopter flying and like all of a sudden it starts blinking like hey look the blinky thing's going again <laughs> and it's great because like they, they go and they fly straight there and it, it it it's it's clearly a trap like where has it been for the last six hours <laughs> Like it did like do you think they changed the batteries for you like is that what you think happened it's just it's wild because like were they just out flying around? They were just flying around for days. Like, were they looking or were they just doing different things? Like I think they just use the helicopter for everything. Like we gotta go to Seven Eleven, make a run. Get the Apparently they didn't even need to fly around because they end up right back at <laughs> yeah, the exactly. um, at the bone at, at, at the plane yard airplane. Yeah, plane yard graveyard. And what's great too is like it's supposed to be a trap. They show up and they 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 find the tracker. And then they look up and they see Hartley and Marlboro Man. Marlboro's putting in some uh, coke. You know, n- n- none of that pussy ass skull, but coke. <laughs> <laughs> There's just this moment where like they stare at each other and then like they run off. And then it's it, it's like sitcom style shoot them one by one 
as they like pop out around planes and stuff. Like at one point, Don Johnson's like hiding inside the front of a plane nose. It's, it's totally a vice moment because they have the shootout. Haraway can't hit anything, so Marvel Man has to do all the shooting basically. It, even at the very end, which is the, like the funniest moment in the movie when he shoots Marvel Man. I know, he's like, <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> when that happens, I like laughed out loud, I'm like, oh my god. He actually, like, they didn't do, like, the moment where it's like, he's finally going to be able to squeeze no, the trigger no, right. No, really didn't do it. <laughs> no, he just shoots more. <laughs> he just shoots it right in the shoulder. In the, in the arm where he's already been shot by one of yeah. the other guys. But they're also, like, making jokes at each other throughout. Like, Marvel Man is talking shit to Harley throughout mm-hmm. the time, at, you know, telling him how many people he's killed and how and much how much each bullet costs mm-hmm. so like so when yeah. he's loading up the gun he's like Two. <laughs> and then after he gets shot yeah, he like, just spent 12 dollars and didn't hit a thing yeah and then after he they finally kill Daniel trench Baldwin. coat one he's like you think the scene's gonna end but then it doesn't end because marvel's like i can't believe you shot me you son of a bitch <laughs> you, did, you shot me also, like, it was comical when they shot, when they killed the main guy, right? Because they kill him, and it's like, they shoot him, like, a bunch of different times. <laughs> like, first in the arm, yes. and then in the leg, and then this, and then they shoot him really good. It's like, we're going to shoot him really good and make sure he's dead. Which, also- throughout the movie, we have been, we have been kind of shown that Don Johnson is a really good shot. But, like, this last sp- series of scenes, you know, he's, like, killing every single guy himself. While Mickey Rourke's like shooting everywhere, it almost to the point in which you would think like he was a gunslinger, guys, you know, like, mm-hmm. like almost like he was a trick shot guy, mm-hmm. like he was Willie Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> And so now we're going to go like the final, which the movie could have ended right here. Could have been I mean, like, I okay, think it should have ended. But we still got to go to the should, bank. I mean, what, what did they, did they just bury them next? Did they just leave the body? So is there like police tape around the bar and now they're going to find a bunch of bodies at the airport? Surprise for the people that work at that airport, I guess. <laughs> So, like, they're, like, serial killers or mass murderers at this point. So I there's think no was... context to any of this. Yeah, exactly. Like, who knows what, what is going on by the police perspective. These guys are just murderers. Everybody. Also, didn't I, yeah. I thought it was really funny that they took the helicopter, and the helicopter pilot's like, sure, yeah, I'll take you. Because like, <laughs> the other guys were jerks. He's like, those other guys were, were basically douchebags, and they were, you know, they wore I... protective coating on their clothes. Like, <laughs> I instantly thought of Jimbo from Vice. Yeah, exactly. Thinking, like, like, oh, of course, the buddy pilot and he ends up coming in clutch at the end yeah because when they get to the bank and they have their moment with tom sizemore who is on a call with like japanese investors he's not speaking japanese. he's supposed to be speaking japanese tom sizemore i guarantee you cannot speak japanese he, he was just speak yelling English. gibberish <laughs> <laughs> It has to be. If, if he is, in fact, just yelling gibberish, that's supposed to sound like he's Japanese. That's probably the most racist thing I've ever seen in a movie. Yeah, Anything yeah. else in any other movie. You gotta look it up. Him just yelling, Jap- like, just making Japanese <laughs> sounds. So Harley's there to, and Marvel. They're there to make a pitch to say, we're just gonna make it right. We're gonna give you back your money. You give us a deed, deed to the bar, and then we'll just call it even. And Sizemore says, no. Why would I do that? <laughs> no. And I don't think you're here to kill me. And Harley says, okay, fine, Marble, go ahead and do it. Marble can't do it, and Harley can't do it. So Well, Marble was- won't do it because he says, like, I can't because it's, he's not holding the gun. And my dad always told me I shouldn't kill a man with that, without a gun. And, and <laughs> meanwhile, Tom Sizemore's listening and judging. He's just sitting there patiently, like, so what are you guys going to do? Like, <laughs> I know, Yeah. Gonna, and Tia Carrera is there, too. Like, Come on, guys. <laughs> I got a meeting in a half hour. <laughs> I, I think it's great that they asked for the club, and he was like, no, fuck you. No, I'm yeah, keeping like, the club. No, <laughs> nope, not going to get the club. What, what's great, too, is that at the end of this, they still don't get the club. No, I know. <laughs> also, he just brags about how much money he makes. Like, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I have this job as a front, and I make, like, whatever, $50,000 a year to be the, which, what, by the way, okay, that's not very... $500,000 oh, 500, to be like, the, like, like, the manage the bank yeah. of $50 million selling yeah, drugs. Yeah, exactly. Like, he tells them all about, yeah. like, he's just rubbing it in their face. Like, that's how much money I make. <laughs> and, I was fully, <laughs> and I was fully expecting them to be, like, like all of a sudden, like, the twist was going to be, like, oh, and now they're working with the cops. They finally did the moral thing and went to the police. The great things that happened in this final moment. A... The, they waste so much time that guards come in and then they have to like wrestle, but Marvel still won't kill him without a gun. So it's like this tosses them a gun and then they still wrestle. B, the helicopter comes down and sh- unloads into the room. I like that he has to tell them to get out of the way though. He like puts <laughs> lines up and he's like, get out of the way. <laughs> 
And three, Sizemore dies by falling out of the window because his boot falls, because Marvel Man's boot comes off and he falls out of there. And then all of this, no police investigation. No. No worries his about the girlfriend police. girlfriend works for the police and that lieutenant's not going to... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> He's got bigger things to do. Yeah, no need to involve the police. Let's just uh, immediately jump to like a month later and Marvel Man has gone back to the rodeo because that's where he should have been all along and Mickey Rourke has decided that he's just going to go travel the open roads. Which is what they were doing before this movie started. They got nothing, right? Yes. No, they yeah. didn't get anything. So no, like, I think they still have the money, though. That's why. I, I that's feel why bad for had the people nice at that clothes. bar because, like, had they just kept, you know, being in the rodeo and and doing their thing and not ever come to the bar, like the people from the bar would all still be alive. Yeah, the bar well, might have closed, but they would still the be record, alive. Yeah. For the record, if, if Harley hadn't come to the bar because Marlboro Man lived there, like mm-hmm. he goes there all the time. You see them. He's like, we can't mm-hmm. go there because whatever, you know. Yeah. Harley's the problem. Yeah, not Marvel Man. He's he, he's just gonna live his life like regular. Harley came back into I town after two years and ruined bar everything. To hang out at. And that's what I'm saying about Harley though is that you get to the end and he's still not able to. He doesn't do anything. The, this movie is all Marvel Man. Harley doesn't kill the bad no, guy. No, he, he doesn't, doesn't do anything. First he doesn't he, kill the trench coat mafia. He doesn't like. He doesn't do anything. But he also doesn't change, right? Like so, Marvel Man. I know. I I get that he goes back to. Well, no, actually, does he does change because he's doing something he hasn't done in years. Like he hasn't gone and do the rodeo since his dad was alive, and he got thrown off the horse and he broke his arm and all stuff like that. So he is doing different stuff. He did change. And what, he tells Virginia that too. Like I'm changing. Yeah, now, I know you're not going to give me another chance, but, but I'm, I'm still going to change. I, yeah. I regret how I treated you. Yeah, like and I, I just don't want it to end like this. If it's going to end, I don't want it to end being like this. Not Harley though. He's going to go out and do his thing and still be a terrible shot and probably really bad in bed. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, the much? last <laughs> thing we the last thing we see is he picks up what, what looks to be like I don't know was that Christy Brinkley or someone? I don't know, but she <laughs> like looks so much some... like the girl in the picture. I thought yeah. that was really weird. It's not, though, because I looked at the thing. It said girl in the picture and then it said girl at the end. It wasn't, but she looked so, so much like the girl in the picture that had left in. And I was like, is that supposed to be so, her? And like, just going full circle? Like, <laughs> Well, so she wasn't the girl in the picture, but apparently there's a lot of models on the side of the road in wherever part of Nevada they were. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to get into my final thoughts here, but like, just that's why we love these kinds of movies because even though there's all this other weird stuff that doesn't make any sense mixed into it there's still a thread of a solid story of moral man going yeah. from i don't like uh, uh how i am in the world doesn't matter i don't care what's going to happen to me in the future to the end being like no i have a future you know i yeah. I, I apologize to virginia mm-hmm. i'm gonna get back into rodeo i'm gonna start taking my life more seriously harley doesn't change throughout the entire thing but there still is this one thread of a a good story that's woven through there with some wacky stuff. <laughs> uh. <laughs> well, before we dive too much into our final thoughts on this, let's pause and go talk about the music that is in this movie. We're keeping our vice the way that we do. Our, I love how we do rundowns on these things. We're just switching it to movies. So let's go talk about the music that was in this movie. And music is always going to be stellar because that's a soundtrack of movies, especially from this era. So let's go break down this music. <laughs> All right, John, as I mentioned, there's soundtracks to movies, so it's not always only the music that appears in the movie. There's also music that could just be released on a soundtrack. Now, this movie happens to have a lot of music that appeared in the movie, which, to be honest with you, I didn't really hear that much as the movie was going on, but there there was more music than I thought there was. What do you got for us this week? All right. There's a little bit of a theme that there was a lot of country rock, country, southern rock, with a little bit of glam rock. So let's uh, dive right in for the first song that showed up in the movie, Wanted Dead or Alive by Bon Jovi. Bon Jovi was formed in 1983. In Sayreville, New Jersey, the band was made up of John Bon Jovi, Richie Sambora, David Bryan, Tico Torres, and John Such. Their third album, Slippery When Wet, which was released in 86, sold over 20 million copies. And I think growing up, me and my brother, that tape never left the tape deck while we were in elementary school. That is a soundtrack like that was every to day going. <laughs> yep. Every day going to school, the only time Slippery When Wet came out was every once in a while Def Leppard Hysteria would work its way in there. About one every other, every third day. Bon Jovi's just a huge, iconic band. They were huge in the 90s. They released 14 studio albums and are one of the best-selling rock bands ever. And John Bon Jovi's been in, involved in a bunch of other stuff, too. 
He owned the Philadelphia Soul, which was an arena mm-hmm. football league team uh, for many years. He was also he also did some movies himself. He was in Young Guns 2, Bed of Roses, U57, which I always forget he was in U57, U571. I don't remember. I don't know what that movie is, though. So. That It's a submarine movie. Our next song that pops up is The Bigger They Come, which is a Peter Frampton song. Peter Frampton, known for his hits, Show Me The Way, Baby, I Love The Way, Do You Feel Like We Do, which is the one where he makes his guitar talk and i'm in you so and so peter frampton actually his story goes all the way back to when he was 12 years old he went to the same school as one david bowie peter frampton's dad was david bowie's art teacher they both went to the same school david bowie was a few years older than peter but they were both in band and every once in a while they would jam together at lunch like they were friends peter frampton would actually have a lot of success like childhood success he would have bands humble pie and the herd which would have a little bit of success and would lead to some early solo work but he really wouldn't break out until 1976's frampton comes alive that album dropped he sold eight million and then like that's pretty much where he peaked peter frampton he'd have a near fatal car crash in the bahamas in 78 a few years later after that he would keep making music through the 80s and 90s and even up in the 2000s but he never really reachieved that same success that he had with Frampton Comes Alive but he has worked with a ton of other artists too so uh he's still famous he was also in an episode of episodes of Family Guy and The Simpsons so we love him (laughs) the next song is Let's Work Together by Kentucky Headhunters Kentucky Headhunters are a country rock southern band founded in 1968. They were originally called the Itchy Brothers. <laughs> Coming in and with they great consisted, name. yes, and they actually consisted of brothers, Richard and Fred Young, along with Greg Martin and Anthony Kenny. The Itchy Brothers would last until 1982, releasing albums and touring, and that's when, in 82, after a brief hiatus, in 86, the Headhunters would be born. It would consist of the Young Brothers and Martin, with the addition of Ricky Lee and Doug Phelps. They would release their first album and produce a top 40 country hit. Uh, Their second album wouldn't do so well, and that was it. The Phelps Brothers were out. They would leave to start (laughs) Brother Phelps. So, dueling brothers. <laughs> brothers Phelps, by the way, would have a top six hit of their own before Doug would leave eventually to rejoin Kentucky Headhunters, while Ricky Lee Phelps would go on to have a solo career. Kenny would eventually rejoin the Headhunters, and they would release uh, eight studio albums all together. They're actually kind of a sleeper country band. Like, they've been around forever. I don't know shit about country, so... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Next songs are the Stop the World and Come On by the Screaming Jets. The Screaming Jets are an Aussie hard rock band formed in 1989. They were formed by Dave Gleason, Paul Woosin, Grant Walmsley, Richard Laura, and Brad Heaney, like the most Australian names ever. They would release three albums that peaked into the top five in Australia. Gleason and Walmsley actually met in college in 81 they had their first band sudden death in 85 and then later be which would later become aspect so it's just full of terrible names <laughs> before they would eventually become the screaming jets the screaming jets that would release eight albums with their most recent album being gotcha covered released in 2018 so guys they're still releasing stuff Damn. you just don't hear it because it's just being played in australia <laughs> But I, I bet you they've made a ton of didgeridoos. <laughs> so many, so many didgeridoos that they've made. They just can't keep them all in their bank. <laughs> yep. So our next uh, grouping of songs. Guys, they gave Vanessa Williams three songs on this uh, soundtrack. And at first I thought, like, that was nice of them. And then I realized she was only in the movie for like 30 seconds. And I was like, oh, no, they just wanted their money's worth. <laughs> <laughs> so we talked about vanessa williams already in the uh guest stars she was the uh miss america winner who was robbed of her crown for, for real though when we talked about it earlier like it's not her fault 
No, she didn't do anything wrong. Yeah, she didn't do anything wrong. And there's those people who say stuff like, well, she shouldn't have taken the nudes. Like, you're not her. She could take it. Anyone can take as many nude pictures of themselves that they want. And, and at the time, it may have felt like it was for the right person or whatever it is. It doesn't mean that those people are allowed to share them. For the record, like, mm-hmm. I know a lot about this. They were not nude photos like she took. They were not nude photos like she took with somebody that she was mm-hmm. with. They were actual, like, professional photos that she had taken. And they were not all nude. Some of them were, like, in her lingerie and stuff. But they were professional pictures that a professional photographer had taken. They got leaked yeah. out. And then they were like, oh, we didn't know you had these. I don't think they were, like, a, like mate or somebody that she knew took them or she was sending them you know what i mean yeah yeah i, mean, I just think they were not saying them out to people no i could take <laughs> thousands of dick pics right i mean like multiple <laughs> a day yeah and it is okay for me to do that because yeah. it's me i'm you know they're whatever they're for i'm allowed to do that that doesn't mean that anyone else can then share them if i yeah. want to share them fine but if mm-hmm. someone sends it to penthouse and penthouse runs it like that wasn't me that sent it to you. I'm not in the wrong here. Yeah, no, she wasn't in the wrong. She just did it. She was a young girl trying to make it into the business of of modeling, and she took those pictures, and that's that's what she explained it as. Like it was like I was a young girl, and mm-hmm. I was trying to make it as a model, and I got paid to take those pictures, but I never they never were published to put them anywhere, yeah. and I never thought they were going to come back. That's why I didn't say anything about the Miss America, the Miss America pageant. Yeah, yeah. So, well, let's uh, move on to our next song, Wild Obsession by L.A. Gunn. L.A. Gunn sounds familiar. That's because they are, they were formed in 83 by Tracy Gunn and Rob Gardner, uh, and they are half of what would eventually become Guns N' Roses. (laughs) They would merge with the defunct group Hollywood Rose and make Guns N' Roses in 85. And then promptly half, most of their members would be fired from Guns N' Roses. (laughs) Axel Rose was kind so of So Tracy hard. Guns. <laughs> yes. They would merge bands and then eventually Guns. So like the LA Guns became a band again because Tracy Guns got fired. So he went and just started LA Guns again. He's like, yeah, I still got a band. Um, I'm okay. <laughs> yeah, they would reform, but it, there would be continual lineup changes until eventually they would form the super group Brides of Destruction with Motley Crue's Nikki Six. Nice. In 2002. But that would even be short-lived. Eventually, they would reform again the band known as L.A. Guns and would soldier on. And eventually, Tracy Gunn would rejoin. So, to date, they've released 12 studio albums. But still, not as popular as Guns N' Roses. <laughs> eh, just a little behind. Kind of wish they'd stuck with that Hollywood Rose group. <laughs> Our next song is Hardline by Waylon Jennings. And Waylon Jennings is country royalty. Like when you talk about old school country, you talk about Willie Nelson, Johnny Cash, uh, Merle Haggard, Waylon Jennings. So, but Waylon Jennings actually has a crazy kind of start to his career. In 1958, Buddy Holly arranged Jennings' first recording session and then promptly hired him to play bass for him. Mm. Jennings actually gave up His seat on the ill-fated flight in 59 that would kill Buddy Holly and the Big Bopper and Richie Valen. What had happened was that they were traveling on a tour bus and it was like a freezing cold blizzard. It hit the East Coast or or no, the North. uh, I think they were in Minnesota. They just finished a show in Minnesota. And so no one wanted to ride on the tour bus. And so... Buddy Holly and some of them were going to fly on a plane. And Waylon Jennings gave up his seat along with one of the other band members from Holly so that Bopper and Valens and some of the other band members who were sick could ride on the plane. Obviously, the plane would crash, they would die. But Waylon Jennings would go on to have a massive country career. He's cited as being one of the uh, creators of Outlaw Country. He recorded country music's first platinum album wanted the outlaws with willie nelson even after getting into some drugs and uh mixed up in some drugs and stuff mostly hanging out with bad influences like johnny cash (laughs) he would actually be in a super group with him and from 85 to 95 he would release three albums with the highway men with willie nelson johnny cash and chris christopher so i mean and guys ever a super group that is one that is a super group oh yeah I grew up oh, looking yeah. to that so. super group. <laughs> and guys, just because uh, you guys live in Arizona, he actually, way back in the day, before the Buddy Holly stuff and everything, 
He was a regular DJ at a club in Scottsdale, Arizona called JD, mm. where it all started. <laughs> you know, Arizona became a state in 1912. So we're actually talking about like that might be an era where the people are still coming to Arizona in covered wagons. Like when William <laughs> Jennings was working at a radio station. <laughs> Some radio station. <laughs> Next song is Ride With Me by Black Eyed Susan. Black Eyed Susan existed between 1990 and 1992. They were a Philly band formed by ex Britney Fox frontman Dizzy Dean Davidson with former Cinderella keyboard Rick Critton. Crit- Crinity uh, on guitar. Why they hired a keyboardist <laughs> to play guitar, I, I don't know. But their first album, Electric Rattlebone, was a commercial failure. It was such a failure that the uh, record label <laughs> refused to release their second album. And that was. Such and a that was... Setup. <laughs> <laughs> their first album, Death Rattlebone, was Damn. a commercial failure. <laughs> Yeah, so was it was so one. bad, they refused to release the follow-up album to it, and so the band Black Eyed Susan was no more. <laughs> you might say, and, you failed to gain traction. <laughs> <laughs> Produce any hits. <laughs> <In producing hits. laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, so this brings us to our last song, Long Way From Home by Copperhead. Now, guys, when I first looked up Copperhead, Wikipedia told me that it was a rock band founded by guitarist John Cipollina after he left the band Quicksilver Messenger Service in 1970. Because bands in the 70s had long, terrible names like the Alan Parsons Project and Quicksilver <laughs> Messaging Service. And I thought that was pretty obscure, you know? Especially since they were originally signed to Sun- Just Sunshine Records. And one of the band members would leave immediately to go back and record with Rod Stewart. And that would be a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> because their debut album would be a failure. But it turns out that's the wrong Copperhead. It turns out the right Copperhead, who did Long Way From Home, was the Copperhead from the 1990s, a southern hard rock band. This according to neilcarswell.com. <laughs> that sounds reputable. <laughs> By the way, Neil Carswell was is the lead singer. So this is a reputable source. I don't know. <laughs> he Are would know. Sure? He would know he was there. <laughs> <laughs> they were a 90s rock band, one of the last great, one of the last great southern rock bands. Yeah. According to a lead singer, <laughs> to a band that doesn't they even were, have a Wikipedia page. Exactly. <laughs> they were originally signed by Mercury Records, their first single. This song was featured on this soundtrack, their song Busted. Was featured on the soundtrack of the move on of the movie Doctor Giggles, <laughs> which is a horror movie, by the way. Doctor yeah, Giggles sure is. is a horror movie. <laughs> their song slash video, the video for their song Whiskey, got regular play on MTV. I swear to God, it did. <laughs> 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 and they toured with, of all people, Kentucky Headhunters, 38 Special, and Molly Hatchet. Guys, good news. Neil Carswell and Copperhead in 2005 put out some new music. Oh, they released thank a God. Bunch, I've been waiting. A couple new albums. <laughs> and you can buy it, guess where? At neilscarswell.com. <laughs> <laughs> if you go to neilcarswell, I- I'm telling you guys, go there. <laughs> I support Neil. I recommend it. Let go support Neil. Buy some Copperhead music because they are one of the last great Southern <laughs> hard rock bands, according to Neil. And I believe him because he was there. Oh man. You know, I do appreciate that we got through this whole music segment and I don't believe Genesis or Phil Collins <laughs> came up in it. Or, so. Well, David Bowie, though. Yeah. David Bowie did come up in oh, it. Oh, yeah. David Peter Bowie. Right. Yeah, David yeah. Okay. Bowie. Because of Peter Frampton. Yeah. <laughs> Damn you, sneaky, Peter Frampton. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go give our final thoughts on this movie. Uh, I have many. Uh, including ties to other movies. So let's go give our final thoughts on this one and wrap this thing up. Okay, I am going to kick off on our final thoughts on this. And I know normally that means like Dominic's got something 
important he would like to get off his chest, and that is not the case. I just want to go first. <laughs> I just want to get over. <laughs> I'm just going to get right down to it. The nitty gritty. <laughs> yes, just straight to the point here. Harley Davidson, the Marlboro Man, is a remake of a break into Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> I mean, in a sense, yes. <laughs> They're out to save their favorite dance hall, I mean bar, and they got to stop the city, I mean the bank, from taking over <laughs> their favorite place to be. <laughs> it turns out it may have been more successful if they challenged everyone to a dance off. I mean, if they had done that, that, that movie would have sold out. Also, this movie would have been better with Shabadoo in it. Just saying. <laughs> Everything's better with Shabadoo in it. I mean, he was in Miami Vice, for God's sake. Hey, I, I, I really did like this movie. And it had the twist that it turned into a sci-fi movie. I was like, oh, interesting. This is the way to take this movie. <laughs> A <laughs> way I would not imagine would work, and it Probably actually Davis didn't. Is but... <laughs> man, it's also slightly in the future. Just a little bit, though. <laughs> like, like, I felt like if you're gonna go in the future, like go all the way in the future, no, not like, I just like go like three four years, years later. <laughs> exactly. Like in the apparently in the next four years, planes are gonna look kind of different, and they're gonna fly in between buildings. <laughs> <laughs> but jokes are gonna be awesome. <laughs> There's some message in this movie about how, like, modern times are bad or old times are just as bad there's as no modern times or something movie. like that. There's some <laughs> message in there about this. No, there's not. <laughs> but I liked the fact that these are a couple of nobodies and that by the end of it, you really are pulling for them to be able to, to, be able to pull this off. The twist at the end of them saying, like, we just want to make it right, eh, probably too far. Probably would have scaled that back a little bit and been like, we just want, we're gonna keep in the money, but we want the bar because we know that you're dealing in drugs. And John, you're right; it would have been if they were like wearing a wire then or something like that, like they're working with the police somehow. With Virginia, <laughs> yeah. But as I mentioned earlier, Virginia, there's Gina, right? <laughs> as I mentioned earlier, there's this thread from Overall Man of a good story that's buried in there, and that's what it is with almost all of these types of movies where they're like. Uh, they have some cult fans, but otherwise they're not considered to be that good of a movie. It's because they have a single story, but they're forced to build everything else to fit 90 yeah. minutes. They don't have 90 minutes worth mm -hmm. of material. They have like 27 minutes worth of material for a single character. <laughs> Sometimes only like five. But <laughs> <laughs> so then they have to map out all these other characters and stuff like that. It's really interesting to see how Harley just descended into immaturity throughout the entire movie and never really develops as a full character. But it doesn't matter. It's all about Marlboro Man. And Marlboro Man is the best part of this movie. And Don Johnson is the best part of this movie. And like his story, the acting, everything's set up for him. It's all the best stuff. And I really liked it. John? What are your final thoughts? Uh, you know, it felt it felt fitting that this used to be a Miami Vice podcast, and that the first movie had a very Miami Vice TV show quality to it. It had a little bit of the goofiness to it, but the storyline kind of felt kind of similar to a Vice episode too, where we kind of had drugs, and but it also had a little bit of a like a Tango and Cash, a Last Boy Scout kind of action movie to it. What a really appropriate movie for us at transitioning from Miami Vice to these action movies is that it kind of felt like a merge of both, where we got a little bit of a Vice feel, but we also got the Last Boy Scout. What I love about this era of action movies is that at a certain point, all reason and logic goes out the window. <laughs> you know, at a certain point, it's just shoot the bad guys, bang, bang, and explosions and car chases and you kind of forget about like the real world aspect of these people would probably be arrested for doing this or like they would never make it this far i think that at a certain point the movie just kind of stumbled around because it it you got to a certain point and realized like like you kept saying like it could have ended anywhere but they didn't know where to end it at all and so like where they ended up ending it was a little bit too long it should have ended just at the bank of at, of at any point we finally got to the bank with tom sizemore like it probably should have just ended there but you could see like they they didn't want to do the traditional action throw them out the building they were trying to do a different style ending and i think what it was is they were trying to find some kind of moral of the story to put to it and realize like guys we 
we got nothing. Like, there's no moral to this. Like, there's nothing was accomplished through any of this. It was just a fun action movie. And now they're going to go off and be Harley Davidson and Marvel Man again. It's almost like like they became folk heroes and, like, they just went on to become folk heroes. Marvel Man's going to travel around with a rodeo now and, and shoot people in the head. And <laughs> Harley Davidson... <laughs> and Harley Davidson's going to hang out on billboards and uh, sleep with random women who need rides home. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, what are your final thoughts? Like John said, it is a perfect movie for us. To, it has like, it's a lot like Miami Vice. It's got the zany parts where you're like, oh, this is fun. Like serious stuff is happening, but you're not really absorbing it. That would happen in Miami Vice. There'd be a shootout and someone would die and like, all those people are dead, but we're not going <laughs> to talk about that. Let's talk about this. <laughs> Obviously, I agree because I love Don Johns, but his his character was the best character and the most well written and the best acted everything out of that whole movie. But it was it's disappointing that they didn't give. I love that movie. I liked it. I liked every part of it. Yes, it was didn't make any sense. Like the storyline doesn't really go where you think it's gonna go. It doesn't where you doesn't go where you think it should go. <laughs> kind of just goes <laughs> off the rails. There's no moral to the story for for Harley. Like, it's gonna be the same person. He doesn't change. He doesn't get any worse. The same person. And I. I mean, they could have made his character better, and they probably should have, but I would still watch that movie over and over and over again, because it's what I love. It's action. There is there is some emotion stuff in there, but it's not too heavy where you're, like, crying because something happens, or, you know, like, I can't I can't handle too much emotion because I cry at commercials, so I don't need any extra. <laughs> That's why I like those kind of movies, because they're fun, like Tango and Cash, like, you know, fill in the blank, all these different movies where they're all in that same era and genre, where it's fun, stuff happens. Yes, there's some serious stuff, but you, they also pepper it with like they're joking about how bad Harley is a shot when he's when mm -hmm. Don Johnson's shooting people literally in the head. <laughs> so yes, I like it. I would watch it again. I will say in the last little moment that maybe if you get rid of the sci-fi element and just make yeah. them like mobsters and cocaine, <laughs> then you're good to go. Not so yeah. much in the future. <laughs> Only go a year and a half into the future. <laughs> yeah. That going four years is too much. <laughs> and that's going to do it for us this week on Go With The Heat. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We would love to hear from you. Email us, goalwiththeheat at gmail.com, twitter.com slash goalwiththeheat, facebook.com slash goalwiththeheat, instagram.com slash goalwiththeheat. We'd love to hear from you because we want to hear what you think of the new format, what movies we should check out, and then just general feedback on, on this new direction that we're taking the podcast. We'd love to hear from you. Email us, goalwiththeheat at gmail.com. As I mentioned, you can get a hold of us on all those other places on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. We're pretty much available anywhere and everywhere. Also, just last note, this is a bi-weekly show now, too. So when you're listening to this, it's going to come out every other Monday. So just FYI, be sure to check out that website, goalwiththeheat.com. You can find all the ways to contact us, all the ways to listen to the show, and all the show notes, which are very detailed now. All of them ripped off from other websites, <laughs> all compiled right into a, <laughs> into a single page. All the information you can need right there on that website, goalwiththeheat at gmail.com. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals. Don't forget... Stop by neilcarswell.com <laughs> Check out his new music <laughs> New music from Copperhead <laughs>